Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. Thank you for taking the time today to learn about managing FPGA resources as virtualized accelerator blocks. My name is Kent Dorfner, and I am the VP of Architecture for Acronic Semiconductor. We're going to be talking today about embedded FPGAs. So the idea with an embedded FPGA is you are developing an ASIC yourself, but you're putting an FPGA core inside of the FPGA. Our term for this is a speed core. And a speed core embedded FPGA IP, it's a customized FPGA fabric for integrating into an SOC or an ASIC. With an embedded FPGA, you get to define the amount of FPGA resources that you have on your chip. You get to control the number of lookup tables, the memory, and the DSP and MLP blocks. Currently, with our speed core embedded FPGAs, we have them available on TSMC 16, 12, and 7 nanometer processes, and soon they're going to be available in five. They'll be delivered in GDS2 format, and they're supported by our ACE development tools. I'll point out that Acronix is the only supplier with both embedded FPGA and standalone FPGAs, both of which are shipping in high volume. So we're going to talk a little bit about what an FPGA is and what are some of the benefits. So if you are currently using FPGAs adjacent to your ASIC to provide for the, the kind of flexibility that common applications need, you'll find that putting an embedded FPGA inside the die provide with significant cost reductions. Mm -hmm. It's much cheaper to put the FPGA inside than to put it adjacent. Part of the reason is that you can make the FPGA have the right amount of resources. You eliminate the vendor margin for the FPGAs and you remove the package and IO cost of external FPGA. Power is a similar story. Instead of driving the copper between your ASIC and the FPGA that's adjacent to it, all of that becomes on chip. You've got just the resources you need and you make the interface power much, much lower. Bandwidth is a similar story. Instead of trying to drive all of the connectivity between these coffer traces on the, on the PCB, you get all of this really, really low latency and high throughput on die connectivity. If we look at the bottom right-hand corner, we keep going with latency. It's much, much lower latency to connect to the FPGA core inside the ASIC to the subsystems that you care about than it is to have to go to a PCB. And then finally, this provides you a significant flexibility and the ability to extend your product lifecycle because you can change what the FPGA is doing over time and you have the ability to release multiple products that are actually based on the same die, but the personality that you have in the FPGA allows it to have different functionalities. So when we build an FPGA for you, what we're doing is we're taking some standard blocks like logic, some block memory, some arithmetic capabilities, such as our MLP, some LRAM capability. We're building them together with some blocks that you provide us that we call custom blocks that really provide you with the capability of controlling what exactly is going into this FPGA. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. But you have tons of flexibility here. You control the number of lookup tables, the amount of memory, and the number of arithmetic blocks, and finally, the number of custom blocks that we have. So we have great flexibility. We actually build this for every single customer slightly different so that the capabilities of the FPGA perfectly match your ASIC and your end application. Some of the features that we have available inside our high performance embedded FPGA cores include our new machine learning processor or MLP. So this is an arithmetic block that's really optimized for artificial intelligence and machine learning. So it allows us to have a densely packed multiply accumulate elements that support integers and floating points. And what we've done is in the same column, inside the same tile, we've merged our deep memories, what we call our BRAM 72K that allows you 72 kilobits of storage, as well as a very low latency two kilobit register file that allows combinatorial reads. So this gives you very tight cooperation between the memories and the multiply accumulate engines. You can imagine that you're providing a set of operands from the FPGA fabric, while the second set of operands comes from your contextual memory, which is your BRAMs. So that allows you with denser operations and much lower latency, plus you get all of this connectivity between the blocks without consuming any of the precious FPGA logic. So this is optimized for AI and machine learning, high bandwidth algorithms with high density compute, tightly coupled memory. This gives you great compute performance. And because this is all implemented without consuming any of the FPGA, we have considerable wins when it comes to power consumption, when you look at the amount of compute that you get per watt. Another key innovation that we have inside our FPGA fabric is a high bandwidth two-dimensional network on chip. 
So if you look at the FPGA fabric there with the blues and the greens, we have superimposed on top of it these yellow lines that represent the high throughput connectivity that we have. Unlike other FPGA suppliers, our on-chip network runs everywhere inside the FPGA fabric. Every one of those yellow stripes gives you 512 gigabits per second in both directions. We support AXI and all of the control information is additional to that. So you get an actual 256 bits at two gigahertz that you use for your data. Uh, we automatically take care of all of your clock crossing and we can give you more than 20 terabits per second in diagonal cross-sectional bandwidth. And in fact, that's what we have done in our own standalone device, the newly released AC17500. This on-chip network can carry AXI transactions, so you can do reads and writes to anywhere in memory. You can deal with Ethernet, or you can have unpacketized streams. By having these connectivity points to the network everywhere throughout the FPGA fabric, it makes the design challenge much, much easier. If you instantiate a slave anywhere in the system, it immediately gives you access to everywhere in the entire device, including talking to all of the external memory, talking to DDR4, GDDR6, communicating with Ethernet, and communicating with the PCI Express in interfaces. This makes congestion much, much easier because you're able to get to external interfaces from everywhere, and it makes timing closure much simpler as well. If you were to take advantage of our on-chip network inside an embedded FPGA, then all of the stuff around the outside that's part of our device becomes owned by you. And what we're providing you with is AXI interfaces all around the boundary of the embedded FPGA instance. Now note that these interfaces can be memory mapped AXI that understand read and write semantics, or they can be data streams. So you could use some of these to say, send in streams of ethernet traffic or send in streams of some other type of traffic. So this can easily enable transactions to and from something like a CPU complex, external memory that you have on your ASIC, DMA engines, graphics accelerators, et cetera. You can also use the traditional FPGA connectivity on the boundary of the fabric to implement some sort of proprietary interface. Because this is an FPGA, the interface can really be anything you want it to be, and you can change the interface over time if you've implemented the ASIC so that you can swap in different uh, external interface types. So this can support basically any imaginable protocol. You can also connect it directly to the balls or the pins on your ASIC so that you have the ability right from your pins to support a wide variety of external interfaces. For example, you might talk to Ethernet data. You might have an interface that exactly matches your Ethernet Mac control and status. You might want to support cache coherency with ACE or CHI. Or you might do something interesting like take a RISC-V that has the ability to extend instructions and connect the boundary of the FPGA fabric to the RISC-V instruction extension port. That lets you add instructions to the RISC-V instruction set where the implementation of the instructions is done in the FPGA fabric, meaning that you can ship your device to customers and then later on add an instruction and have that implemented inside the FPGA. For a similar capability using the ARM processors, uh, family, you can use their accelerated coherency port, which would allow the FPGA to attach between the processor cores and the local L1 cache, allowing the FPGA to see and accelerate a lot of local transactions very, very quickly. So once we have the knock inside the FPGA, it really changes the way FPGA design is done. If you look at the example on the left, this is how you would do an FPGA design before the introduction of the Acronix on chip network. What I've labeled the accelerator blocks, those are whatever your chip needs to do. That's your secret sauce. That's the functionality that you're trying to bring to the market. All of the stuff in red is the stuff that you have to add to the design just to make it work. So if you have two blocks that are talking to external memory, you have to take, traditionally, you have to take care of the address decoding. You have to take care of the back pressure. You have to take care of arbiting between different blocks requesting access to the same resources at the same time. On the way back, you have to make sure the responses get to the correct location. If you have two responses heading towards the same accelerator, they have to arbit for access to that accelerator. And you have to make sure that you've taken care of all of the routing. You also have to take care of yourself, all of the clock domain crossing and FIFOs to get to the eventual destination, which might be on a different clock domain. Using the embedded FPGA that's inside the FPGA fabric, we basically take care of all of that for you. You instantiate in your design a very small block that we call the network access point or the NAP. 
With that, you have either a streaming interface or an AXI interface, and you just issue transactions. And all of that other stuff that's on the red cloud on the left, we just take care of for you. This has a significant impact on the amount of logic that's available in the device for you. If you look at the left, we took a 64 endpoint design running at 128 bits wide at 400 megahertz, and that took 390,000 lookup tables in a modern FPGA which in one example FPGA that we were using was 55% of the available resources. Now over on the right, in our 17500, we're giving you 80 access points. They run at twice the data width, way faster frequency, and it takes zero lookup tables and 0% of your FPGA resources. When this gets implemented in an actual FPGA design, you can really see the results. So what we have here is a convolutional neural network where we've instantiated multiple accelerators and each accelerator is reading and writing data using its local network access point. We did not do any area constraints on the design and that's really important. We gave this design flattened to a place and route tool and it recognized that each of these little CNN subsystems was able to do all of its communications via the local network access point and each block ended up centered around the local network access. So this allows much faster place and route and much better quality of results. In this case, we were able to get 94% of the multipliers and memories available inside the FPGA, all running at 750 megahertz, and we're only using 4%, that's 4% of the available logic inside the FPGA. So we're providing you with incredible compute, and you still have the ability to do a lot of flexible accelerators that you've developed yourselves. This also enables true incremental compilation and partial reconfiguration. You can imagine one team is responsible for some of these blocks. They can place and route their block within a rectangle that represents a couple of clusters. And later on, that gets integrated with a bigger device and the place and route doesn't have to be redone because there's so little overlap and, and interplay between different place and route partitions. Likewise for partial reconfiguration. We have a partial reconfiguration solution that's actually easy to use because the accelerators that are being partially reconfigured take advantage of the local network access point for their communication needs, and they don't need to run across adjacent clusters in order to get to the, to the endpoints that they need to communicate with. With the on-chip network that we provide you, we also provide good support for virtualization and for security. And we do this by allowing each network access point to have an address translation table. What this means is, if you have one block that you've implemented in Verilog or VHDL, and it's accessing some memory, but then you've instantiated that block multiple times, each block can be assigned its own region of memory so that they don't need to share. They don't end up stepping on each other's toes, and each local memory block remains local to that specific block. So as an example, you can see my accelerator one in the upper left-hand corner. It's accessing memory location 0x2000. And the address translation table directs that to GDDR6 number one. In the upper right-hand corner, I have a second block that's also accessing the same memory location 0x2000. But the address translation table has remapped that to be the GDDR6 interfaces that are closest to it so that it gets better performance and so that its private memory is truly private. We have added security features to the address translation table so that you can configure the address translation table so a given accelerator or functional block cannot see portions of memory that are not owned by it. So that means you prevent different blocks from seeing different elements of memory. Of course, the ability to remap memory also supports virtualization because each virtual machine can now be responsible for its own virtualized memory space and any accelerator that the virtual machine owns is remapped to be aware of just that machine's virtual memory space. So if you find that you're going to integrate an embedded FPGA in your ASIC, this shows you how it works. I'm not gonna go through all of the steps, but one of the things that I am going to point out is that the very first thing we do is something called FPGA sizing. We've built our powerful compilation software so that we can add new devices based on your specification very easy. So when you start working with us, you tell us the size of FPGA that you're interested in, the resources you would like to have. One of the first things that we do is give you a revision of the software that supports the device that you've specified. That lets you take your FPGA design and do example place and recompiles. So long before you've taped out, 
you know exactly how your FPGA designs are going to fit in the embedded FPGA, and you'll know exactly the resources that they're going to consume. If you run some of those designs and come back to us and say, you know, I need a little bit more memory, we can easily adjust the, the combination of resources that are going into your embedded FPGA to provide you with exactly the mix that you require. As we go down the flow together, we provide you with the physical layout information, we provide you with all of the timing, the GDS, and then finally, we provide you with all of the test vectors that you need to bring up the FPGA and with all of the software that you need to update the functionality of your embedded FPGA for years to come. Speaking of software, everything that we do is supported by the ACE design suite. This is a full featured FPGA compile environment that supports things like a sophisticated project setup, compilation settings. We have detailed floor plan information, placements. We have cross-referencing between our different tools. We have on-chip debug. So you have the ability to start a on-chip logic analyzer and then look at what's happening really in the hardware. And this applies not just to our FPGA, but to the embedded FPGAs that we put inside your ASICs. And finally, one of the newest capabilities that we have is a knock performance tool that lets you see characteristics of the traffic running inside the on-chip network inside the FPGA fabric. So you're able to see really what's going on and where your bottlenecks are that are based on your design. We have done a lot of FPGAs in our 14 year history, and we're one of the leading companies when it comes to embedded FPGAs. And as such, we have some specialized knowledge that a lot of other companies don't have. I'm going to draw your attention to two sets of documentation here. One is the ASIC integration timing user guide. Embedded an FPGA inside a, an, an ASIC provides for some interesting timing and we've done it all before and we can guide you through that entire process. Another interesting document is our user guide talking about DFT and test. Again, testing an FPGA is interesting because the FPGA logic itself can be used to implement test vectors. So it can reduce the effort required to do the DFT and testing on your chip. And we have lots of documentation showing you just how to do that. So once you have an embedded FPGA on board, there's a bunch of extra capabilities that this opens up for you. None of the things that I have on this view are things that would cause you to put an embedded FPGA on your device. You want to put the embedded FPGA on your device because of flexibility and the hardware-like acceleration that gives you. But once it's there, you get benefits such as the FPGA can be temporarily repurposed to monitor what's going on inside your ASIC, to collect statistics, to tell you about on-chip traffic. You can filter traffic and capture it in some sort of a logic analyzer that's implemented inside the FPGA code. You can capture different packet information, transaction information, timestamps. Um, you have this powerful tool that can be changed all the time to be whatever you need it to be at the moment. For debug and bring up, you can use it as an on-chip traffic generator. You can use it to capture waveform and debug information. At BIST, you can use it to put your at speed BIST vectors to test your external memory. And then once you're out of the out of the bring up environment, then it goes back to being whatever function you need it to be for acceleration. And you can also reduce manufacturing test time because you can use the FPGA itself to drive some of your BIST vectors. Here's an example of our device, the 17500. So this is shipping today. If you're interested in engaging with us in an embedded FPGA scenario, we can provide you with some of these devices so that you can use our tools, you can use our silicon, you can implement some designs, and you can experience for yourself the kind of high-end performance that we can bring to you into your development efforts. You'll note that this is done in seven nanometer cutting edge technology from TSMC. It's a high performance FPGA fabric with a 2D on-chip network, and we support PCI Express Gen 5, we support 112 gigabit per second 30s. It's the only FPGA supporting GDDR6 high bandwidth graphics memories, and we've integrated thousands of machine learning processor vector matrix units. So this is an example of the kind of power and acceleration that we can bring to your ASIC designs. We have a rich ecosystem in the areas of machine learning and AI. We have tools, we have design service partners, we have signal processing, we have low latency um, IP, we have security IP, we partner with companies to do ASIC and SOC design services. So we're developing a rich ecosystem of partners around the Acronix collection of technology. Overall, we have three different product lines. We have the high-end FPGAs that we've discussed. We have the embedded FPGAs that we've discussed. We also have available accelerator cards. 
So these are cards that plug into the PCI Express slot in a PC or a server. They can operate standalone with a full software suite, and they can be used to accelerate data design. They're also a great way to evaluate our capabilities for embedded FPGA integration as well. And all of these are supported by the Acronix East design tools, which provide you with synthesis, verification, timing, programming, and debug capabilities. So in summary, Acronix is the only independent high-end FPGA provider. We've been around for a long time, since 2004. We're headquartered in Santa Clara, California, where our focus is really on high-end FPGAs, which support machine learning, artificial intelligence, smart NIC storage, automotive, 5G infrastructure, and because it's an FPGA, pretty much anything else you can imagine. You're familiar with our key products, high-end FPGAs and embedded FPGAs, and we have more than 1,000 years of R&D effort invested so far. If you look at just our speed core family, we have shipped more than 10 million units to date. Integrating in a speed core can provide you with better throughput, power, latency, and cost. And we do that by making sure that the speed core is sized right to your application needs. You can take advantage of custom columns, which provide you the perfect blend of ASIC performance and FPGA configurability in the columns of the FPGA itself. The high speed on chip network that we provide you gives you 500 gigabits per second per row and column. And it's easy to integrate because we support AXI transactions and streaming, and we can support pretty much any proprietary interface that you can come up with, taking advantage of the fact that we're an FPGA. So if you have any further questions or if you're interested in learning more about what we offer, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you very much for your time today and take care.